conversation. Uh, we've heard a lot of um, big science end of the discussion. I want to bring it back to the practical coalface of exploration. Okay, so we've heard a lot of ideas, you know, one deposit plus two geologists seems to equal three answers. Uh, and how do we decipher all that and turn it into a practical application to get out there and do some exploration? And the, I want to paint for you a scenario. You're doing nickel exploration. Two years ago, you were doing copper and iron ore exploration, but now you're doing nickel exploration. There's already muttering in the winds from investors that might be a really good idea to do graphite exploration. But right here, right now today, you'll want to find out how to do nickel exploration. So you don't necessarily come at it from a scientific background in nickel. Sure, you might have done some nickel exploration in the past, in your early years, some kicking around Cambalder or Leinster or Mount Keith or one of these places, very famous here in WA. But today, you want to be a first mover opportunity in nickel. Now, there's a couple of ways you can be a first mover. We've seen a lot of one way to be first mover. Go into a data rich area with a new model and a new idea and better understanding and see what you can shake loose. Now, the big problem with that from a practical point of view is everybody else is there as well. That ground is tightly held. It's quite expensive to get involved. Sometimes you can't get the back into it. Sometimes you can't get the ground you want. So the other way to be a first mover is to get out there into the moose pasture. We used to say in Canada when I was working early in my career. Trouble is, you've got some geological mapping, it's dubious vintage, probably 1960s, 1970s, based on traverses a few miles apart, air photo interpretation, which doesn't really help you a lot because a lot of it just shows jungle. You've got some stream sediment geochemistry, trouble is though they didn't assay for anything that you're looking for. You've got some satellite gravity data, which could be reasonably handy at that big picture scale. You've got shuttle radar, which is also pretty handy at that big picture scale. And you got really lucky and you found some airborne magnetic data, black and white contour maps that was 1975 vintage flown in Mars. What do you do next? <laughs> but WA is expensive, the ground's held. If you want to do nickel in WA, it becomes an expensive prospect. So, so you go out there. You do the big picture targeting, you have some great exploration concepts that have been developed for nickel at that big picture scale, and you stake 7,000 square kilometres. It's up to you now what you do with that in terms of data acquisition to answer all the blanks. So that's where I want to pitch the talk that I'm doing today, is what do you do at a practical level as an exploration geologist to fill in all these data blanks that we don't have to be able to do these great things at the detail level? And part of that is it's particularly prevalent in nickel exploration, although we're seeing hints of it all across the place in other commodities today. Is, in other words, what are the perils of using a mineral systems approach as a black box? Today's take home message uh, from me today mineral systems, the science versus the black box. Fundamentally, what we're hearing about all day today is understand your targets. Okay? Otherwise, you'll miss and you'll waste a lot of shots doing so. And this is where we get into that other really great power law curve in exploration, the cost, the cost of exploration. Okay, doing that big picture targeting, that's the cheap part of the business. It gets progressively more and more expensive and more and more pressure from your shareholders for results as you get closer and closer to drilling that thing. And when you get to the drilling stage, that's when you're at the most expensive stage. That's where everything's online. You have to prove that you're in the right spot. We understand random exploration, sure you might get lucky, but you want to provide focus. So all of this is all about focus. But what sort of focus do you provide? Sure, we're out there, we're looking for some sort of nickel, right? <coughs> That's not necessarily the focus you want. We're looking for this sort of nickel. That's the focus that we're looking for. Now, I've done a lot of my exploration career not in the yield garden just about everywhere else. That's where I've been looking. But here in Australia, we've had one particularly excellent example of a mineral systems process that's been applied to nickel systems in the Yilgarn with a fantastic track record of success. And that success has honed their exploration skills for this type of deposit. But there is an important difference between the appropriately applied paradigm that we've learned from that deposit and universal management that we take and try to apply elsewhere. So 
And that's one of the things we want people to think about today. Particularly because not all nickel sulfides are born equal. The science of our targets should lead to the science of the exponential strategy we choose and how you interpret the results. So you can focus on what matters, or more importantly, stop chasing what doesn't matter for this particular pod of style you're looking for. Don't waste your exploration dollars on things that are a complete red herring, even though they may work elsewhere. The exploration geologist's toolbox has a variety of scales, a variety of techniques, but what it all comes down to is what is the most cost-effective technique available that dramatically increases your chance of discovery for this deposit that you're looking for. And that choice naturally has to be informed by the understanding of the science behind this particular mineral system that you're looking for. Which really then devolves back to what is the real exploration toolbox, which is this, what we've been talking about all day today, is the mineral systems approach. The science of the mineral systems approach, the physical properties of your system that you need to form that mineral system dictates what techniques you're going to use to search for those physical properties. So here we have two nickel deposit styles, quite dramatically different. The typical Cobalda, Mount Keith, the Mardiot style model on the, the flow facies on the right hand side of the diagram. On the left hand side, relatively simple model of the Norilsk type system, the largest nickel deposit on the planet. But while there are similarities that can be used, be used at that big continental scale, when you get into the detail, there are fundamental differences. And those fundamental differences are going to dramatically change your exploration approach you take. Nickel sulfides in Australia. Um, being a Coes graduate from a long time ago, I know Ross would shoot me if I left Tasmania off this map, so there it is, Ross. Don't worry. Um, this, Neil Gunn was the seed in one of the first nickel booms. It is a world-class nickel province. We've got, between the two various, well, the various different terrains now, the nickel belt, well over 12 million tonnes of contained nickel metal in sulphide, world-class by any means. It's been the subject of intensive scientific scrutiny, <coughs> trying to develop exploration strategies for finding more, and that has led to a relatively simple, robust paradigm for exploration that has a really strong and proud history of success. This area has also been the training ground for several generations of explorers here in WA. I'm quite sure there's a lot of people in this room that have done Kermadion exploration for nickel, or be involved in supporting Kermadion exploration for nickel. But are the lessons that we've learned here in the Yilgard universally applicable for nickel exploration elsewhere? Now, I know some members of this audience know the answer to that question, and know that the answer is no, they're not. But you're not really the target audience. The target audience are those people that a couple of years ago were looking for copper zinc, this year they're looking for nickel, Next year, they might be looking for something else. So, trying to sort through that one ore deposit plus two geologists equals three answers type of evolving, shifting goalpost of what we understand about science. And picking and choosing the right target to apply to where we're looking. And that gets important when we start to look at the other terrains there. <coughs> the Musgraves province, up until the year 2000, we had a fairly good idea it was perfected for nickel. Now we've got over a million tons of containers from over there. The um, Nova Bollinger down in the Albany Fraser. Again, you know, for decades understood to be perspective for nickel. Now we have a rapidly evolving understanding that this is a world-class nickel problem. So what have we learned about finding nickel from the yoga? And at a relatively fundamental basic level, and don't worry, no isotopic systems were harmed during the production of this discussion. Nickel sulfide deposits are located on the basal contact of the thickest, most ultramatic plot of the lithological sequence. At its simplest, most fundamental level, that's what we understand about Kermadio. And based on this, and where we are in the yield garden today in terms of superficial environments, the weathering that's happened, the deformation history, etc., we do have in our exploration data sets of geophysics, geochemistry, and even physical geology flags that we know that we can apply and use to focus the field. So what are the paradigms for Kermadiite nickel exploration? Well, we find nickel on the base of contact in dunite or peridotite or chromatic rocks. Why is that? Well, the black box is that we're looking for thick sequences of IMGO, Australian or chromatic lithologies, because we know that this gives you the best chance of finding nickel sulfides. What is the science behind that? Well, it's fairly simple. It's gravitational settling in a stream sediment analogy. We have a ultramagic flow very low viscosity. If anyone ever wants to see what this thing probably looked like in the real world, I suggest you go to a peronickel smelter 
and processing things in several other orders. So as this stuff flows like water, and probably has roughly you know, an order of magnitude, maybe more than viscosity of water, but several orders of magnitude less than viscosity of basalt. This stuff is very, very, very low viscosity. So dense phases settle through it rapidly and easily. So we're in a stream environment. We're looking for the heavy deposition at the base of that stream. It changes the flow rate. This is the relatively simple paradigm that we've learned in Kumaniites. But we look at the foliate system, we see straight away that ultramagic rocks aren't necessarily the target. Right? As we go through the geological ages, we get down to anything as low as maybe 8% NGO content of these rocks. And that has very different physical properties. These sorts of magmas are actually quite sticky. Sulfides don't rapidly accumulate as easily. You need different processes to be able to form massive sulfide deposits. You can even transport massive sulfides by these ores. This ore will actually physically pick up and move massive sulfide on mass. So there are different sets of paradigms that you need to, to think about. And just a straightaway focus on ultramatic rocks as your target environment, you would miss 70% of the world's nickel ore quantities. So that's something to remember. Ultramatic rocks don't necessarily equate to nickel type. It's a fundamental basic thing, but what I've seen over the years is this automatic, almost immediate reactionary focus on ultramatic rocks as nickel targets, and that's not the case. As we see, we can take essentially any mantle derived olivine saturated magma to composition slightly above more gives you potential to find nickel deposits, not just ultramatic peridotites or dynamite. In our surface media geochemistry, even peak nickel values in commodities can actually work in our favour if they have nothing to do whatsoever with the sulphide deposit. Simply because you accumulate nickel in olivine, you can have up to 0.3 weight percent nickel in olivine. So the laterality process will concentrate this nickel in olivine and give you a blooming nickel signature in your soil geochemistry, sitting right above the, the rock types you're looking for, the ultramatic thick piled portion. So this could be a proxy even just to get you into the environment of the sulphide even though it isn't the sulfide signature for the nickel. But, as we said, chasing ultramatic rocks isn't necessarily going to find you nickel sulfide. So, concentrating on that booming nickel anomaly that you get in soils, maybe 1%, could be completely and utterly drowning out the signature you're looking for. You might be looking for something incredibly subtle that's sitting in a gap road two kilometres in that direction. But the signal is swapped because your focus is straight away this. You're applying a paradigm to the commodity system, looking for the ultramatic rocks without really thinking what the underlying science is behind that. And again, the correlative of the ultramatic rocks is in our regional exploration tools, we, always, we all know for commodity systems that magnetic surveys are probably the best first pass tool you can use to try and focus into where the commodities are. Why is that? Because we know that there is a strong association between the ultramagnetic portions and high magnetics. That's the black box. But why is that in the science? Actually, the magnetite you're looking at has got nothing to do with the primary magnetic system whatsoever. It's serpentinization. You're looking at the result of metamorphic destruction of olivine or superficial ground water destruction of olivine. The, old, the residual serpentinite doesn't incorporate iron into its lattice. So that iron then comes out as magnetite. So the magnetic expression you're looking at has got nothing to do with your nickel forming environment, but just coincidentally sits above the thickest, most ultramatic portion of the sequence. That's where you develop the most sensitive. If we look at um, actual magmatic systems, you do not expect to see at all magmatic magnetite in these rocks, particularly in ultramatic rocks, but also moving into the more Bolitic in member of the spectrum. It's not until you get up to ferrogabro, ferrodiorite, etc., that you might expect to see a substantial amount of primary magnetite. But the trouble is, once you get to those compositions, you're outside the nickel forming window because you move well away from the olivine crystallization time. You fractionated the magnet. These two images, same scale, same field of view, the same stretch on the magnetics, both contain one million tonne contain nickel. The one on the left is the commodity, the typical chain of pearls. 
bit of a no-brainer and where you'd be looking to take out your tenement. The one on the right, high grade, upper grade people like facing the grade like facing through the walking terrain. And the big problem here is, is that the target rocks you're looking for have no magnetic expression. So how do you find them in amongst this sea if they're looking magnetized? So the paradigm of using this tool as your first pass to try to get into nickel exploration, it'll help you map a lot of, map a lot of structure, but it might not necessarily help you target the rocks you're looking for. Let's go take it the other way now. We have some foliate paradigms that sort of crept into the literature. Well, crept into the literature in such, in such that never in the way that I intended. I'm sure Dean Hodgson looks at this diagram and sees how it's been used over the years and, and cringes because it was never his intention how this was being used. And I've seen people talk about this in exploration meetings. So I know this is how they're using it. This is a, uh, a sort of like a holistic deposit model for nickel sulfides in relation to other types of deposits. And we see the nickel sulfide sitting in the base of the large layer of intrusive series at the base of the ultramate. Another problem is that this isn't a formation model and it doesn't really exist anywhere in nature. This is just merely a summary diagram meant to offer a contrast in one picture of different deposit styles. Unfortunately though, I have actually seen this model applied as an exploration model <coughs> for people chasing the bases of ultramatic intrusions large layer series rocks looking for nickel. A lot of exploration dollars going down the drain. So taking what we know from Kamaniites and applying it to Tholiites, and this is what John was talking about earlier, we see that the important part is conduit systems again. Even in Tholiite systems, conduits are what we need, simply because of the mass flux. There is more metal contained in the sulfide within that intrusive system we see today possibly be explained by the amount of magma that surrounds it. So more volume of magma must have gone through that system than what we see preserved. It's a three-foot system. High flux is needed. You need to scavenge effectively the metal from that high flux to create your ore deposit of the coatings we see. So what are we actually looking for in terms of geometry? Well, we're not looking for large layered intrusion bodies at the base of the, base of the ultramatics. We're looking for pipes and conduits. The I don't know if it's obvious to you guys, but on the left-hand side of that diagram, you see a little area, little scale bar, that's 200 metres. So typically, we're looking for deposits, or intrusive systems even, for the deposits inside that intrusive system, where the thickness might only be several hundred metres, and the, the cross-section might only be up to one or two kilometres. And the thing with nickel sulphide systems is, by and large, the signature footprint is contained wholly within the intrusive. There is no aureole around this thing. We might have a very, very narrow metamorphic aureole of the country rocks from the intruders, but that's about it. Unless there's been significant late that deformation that has smeared it across. So in terms of primary signature, it's wholly contained within that intrusive system. So that's the, that's the footprint of what you're looking for. In long section, I mean, the world's largest deposits are uh, Talnak and Darils. You're dealing with intrusive systems that are maybe three, four hundred metres thick, four or five kilometres in cross-section width in places, that's the biggest, 15 kilometres long, but also in the Siberian traps, seven minimised intrusives, I think they are, out of a total of, a total of several thousand. So it's a needle in a haystack job approach to exploration. So, so the idea of looking at large intrusive systems that's perpetuated into the, the mainstream thinking doesn't really apply. We are looking for channels. So like I said, today's take home messages. Uh, we have had, a, I think, a little bit of a cult of violence in Australian exploration because of what we know so well from Kamaniites uh, and the very large success that we've had looking for Kamaniites using those approaches. And then applying that to other terrains doesn't really apply, doesn't really flow. There is so, there's enough differences at the detail level that you need to be very well aware of what those differences are to be able to successfully explore in a non commodity terrain. And like I said, and this is because not all nickel sulfides are born equal. And to bring it up with a, a fairly topical example that's been in the, in the recent press, uh, looking at um, the Albany Fraser Zone, we have here a magnetic structure been touted in the media as, you know, the, the thing to have, uh, does this matter? If you have this, 
you have a better chance of finding nickel. Or more importantly, if you don't have this, you have no chance of finding nickel. If you think no, great. Let's have a chat. I'd like to hear your ideas. If you think yes, great. Let's have a chat. I'd like to think about, hear about your ideas. But unfortunately, some people are falling into, I have no idea, and I'm going to spend millions of dollars doing every single one of them. <laughs> and, you know, why? Let's have a chat. I'd like to hear some of your ideas. Okay, thank you. The rest of this is just essentially advertising for CSA Global. Continue your handouts. Uh, the key contacts, if you want to come and talk to us about mineral systems targeting and how we can help you. And that's essentially who we are and where we've been and what we do. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Do you have any questions? Michelle. Tony, is there nickel <coughs> in the type section for commodity arts in the commodity valley in South Africa? Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I haven't looked at that specifically myself. Um, I've been in the Kamadi Valley looking at other places, uh, and they were, these things were later hydrothermal remobilized nickel that I haven't been looking at in that particular example. Uh, I couldn't answer that question, but there are people here in the audience that could. John, for example. Short answer, no. Okay.